How's it going, everyone? Yesterday, I visited Rico's Aquariums to take a look at how his new tank is doing. Rico's a fellow YouTuber who had one of the nicest tanks I've ever seen. I say had because it's gone. It was a 300 gallon marine land deep dimension and Rico wanted to upgrade to a tank that was significantly larger. A 300 gallon deep dimension has a footprint of six feet long by three feet wide. He ended up going with a custom tank that has a footprint of eight feet by four feet, making it almost double the volume. The new tank moved in late August of last year and it was a little bit of an adventure in its own right. I haven't been back to his place since, so it will be interesting to see how it's come along in the past few months. Let's take a look. All right guys, here it is. This tank has only been up for a couple of months now, and you can see that it's already well underway. There's a lot to cover, so let's go over each part in turn. The first thing that I want to talk about is the aquascape. There was a time when just about everyone's tank had a wall of rock in the back. These days, there's a lot more interest in unique rock structures that incorporate arches and overhangs that provide more visual interest to the rock work. This particular aquascape has some interesting design elements. The first design element are these thin arches and protrusions that cantilever out from the main rock column. What I like about this type of rock work is that it allows for a lot more water flow through the aquascape. Oftentimes, when the reef structure is too densely constructed, flow can be stifled and you kind of wind up with dead spots or inaccessible areas that tend to collect detritus. And those areas can lead to nutrient problems down the road. A more quote unquote airy rock structure like this allows for more water flow as well as access to the substrate if you choose to siphon it. I'm a big fan of siphoning substrate, just so you know. The openness of the rockwork also allows for fish to swim through it and also find hiding spots for themselves if they're feeling stressed. Also, for the corals, it provides a structure that gets more flow around the colony, which has some major benefits such as access to food and faster elimination of waste. Over time, however, large colonies will seal up many of these pathways for flow. And as corals grow, that can be an issue, but let's be serious, that's a great problem to have. One other element to this rock work that you may have noticed is that it's not too high. This is to allow for future growth of corals upward. Sometimes hobbyists underestimate the growth potential of some of the corals and have them almost growing out of the water as a result. It's very tempting to build up rock work all the way to the water's surface on day one, but a lower profile rock structure like this will pay dividends down the road in about 12 months when the colonies really start to take off. Now that I've gone over some of these great benefits, there is a reason why a lot of hobbyists don't go this route. Long story short, it's hard to do. For those out there that have attempted to do fancy aquascapes, you know how difficult it is to do arches and to have pieces of rock precariously extending out from the rockwork. In order to get these shapes, Rico had to drill some of the pieces and install solid acrylic rods to provide that strength as well as using a small fortune and epoxy putty to get everything to adhere properly. Moving on to the fish, there is an eclectic mix of them and there's definitely already a lot of them with more planned in the future. Fish stocking levels are a murky topic in this hobby and I tend to be super conservative on stocking my own tanks. 
There's a few 300 gallon tanks in my system that literally only have two fish in them. In larger aquariums, there is much more flexibility in stocking levels. And I'm noticing a beneficial effect on corals in the tanks that have more fish rather than fewer. This could be for a number of reasons, but the two that I think are the most important is the job that the fish perform on the reef and the fact that they just help feed the corals by being around them. Let's talk about the fish in this tank based on their job class, so to speak. First, you have herbivores like tangs and fox faces. I can't live without these in my systems. I can tell pretty quickly when one of mine goes missing by the way that the algae just grows. At that point, I really miss their contribution to the reef community. There's no perfect herbivore, unfortunately. Tangs can get large and belligerent. Fox faces have a venomous spine to look out for and can get kind of nibbly on corals that they find interesting. This tang is an acanthus mimic of some sort that actually came from Tidal Gardens for free. He was in a 300 gallon tank along with a giant clownfish and they would murder anything that I put in there with them. It looks like he's mellowed out in his old age in this larger aquarium. Now despite these drawbacks, the job that herbivorous fish perform in the tank outweighs the headaches that they cause. Second, there are wrasses. In this tank, I see a few types, such as Melanaris, Cleaner, and Fairy wrasses. Wrasses do a great job of controlling a wide range of pests and diseases on both corals and fish in the case of the Cleaner wrass. I'm not sure the Fairy wrass does as much pest control as a Melanaris, Chorus, or let's say Leopard wrass, but any amount of pressure that they put on any kind of pest population is a net positive. There's also a ton of different species of fairy wrasses, so if you're into some dazzling specimens, you can get lost going down that rabbit hole. Lastly, I should point out that the cleaner wrasse is not the best choice for hobbyists with smaller tanks or tanks with thin fish populations. They perform a great service, especially if one of your other fish is battling ick or a similar parasitic issue, but they need a lot of fish to clean, otherwise they run into nutrition problems. So consider a cleaner shrimp in the tank as kind of an alternative because they pretty much do a similar job, but they don't have the same food issue because they eat just about every kind of food offered. There are decorative fish like Antheus and Cardinals in this tank. Although it's hard to point out any specific task that they perform, just having them in the reef may have a benefit for corals and microfauna. And let's not forget that this is an aesthetic hobby that we presumably got into to enjoy the appearance of. So having a few fish that are there purely for decoration is providing a value in its own right. So not every stocking choice has to be utilitarian, right? As for the corals, this is a mixed reef, but it looks like it's going to be heavily skewed towards SPS with an emphasis on Acropora. Acropora dominate all the prominent real estate on the rockwork, sharing the space with the occasional Montipora here and there. The rest of the corals are relegated to small kind of themed rock islands. For example, here is a rock featuring zoanthids. In the back, there is a euphilia corner. There is a micromusa rock island. And over here, there's a rock for that obligatory bounce mushroom. Rico said that there's an OG bounce that detached and floated away somewhere in this tank, which pretty much mirrors my experience with them. I think I've lost like three or four of them now. In any case, all these are just tiny starter frags, and it will be interesting to see what they do in terms of growth and color over the next few months. Now that we've talked about the animals, let's go over the equipment that makes this all possible. The stand is a super beefy aluminum T-slot build from Framing Tech. The largest sections are four x four, 
and the rest looks like it's two by four. It's definitely overbuilt for a 500 gallon tank, but peace of mind goes a really long way. The adjustable feet are a nice touch as it allows for furniture sliders to be put on them one at a time and then removed one at a time. Obviously this only comes in handy when setting up the tank, but boy, is it helpful for micro adjusting the orientation of the tank to stick the overflow box through the wall. Speaking of the orientation a moment, this is what's called a peninsula tank, where it's three sides viewable, but two of the three sides are the long sides. It makes for a nice room divider look and can be appreciated from both of the big long sides. It's a very cool setup, but there are a few challenges that this style poses that we can cover. The first challenge is the lack of a real background. Sure, one of the short sides is technically a background, but by having both of the long sides viewable, you can see right through it to whatever is going on on the other side of the tank, which can be visually distracting. Sometimes having a regular background is nice in that it isolates the viewer's attention to the tank itself. The second challenge is a technical challenge in that it makes creating flow more difficult. In most aquariums, it's trivial just to put a power head on the side of the aquarium along with a couple of returns from the sump. In a peninsula tank, if you do that, it can look really unsightly. Nothing ruins a three-side viewable tank quite like big pumps and power cords right in the viewing pane. Rico came up with a pretty good design to hide the pumps though. First off, the return lines are a very short run from the sump that's in the back room. The original plan was to have all of them go all the way to the far end of the tank and then blow back towards the overflow box but this is a much more simple and elegant design for the returns. Also, because it's a shorter run of pipe, these returns generate a lot more flow in the tank as there's less friction and less head pressure on the pumps, not having to pump water all the way up the ceiling and then the entire length of the tank before it gets output. Still, it would be nice to have something blow the water back because otherwise all the pumps would be on that one side pushing outwards. Here, you can see the returns and two MP60s located against that back wall. This second set of pumps solves this. And because of the way that they're mounted, they're minimally invasive visually. They're max spec gyre pumps, and they mount to the glass with a magnetic back plate, just like many other pumps. The thing here though, is that the magnet is mounted to the Euro brace rather than the side of the aquarium, so nothing blocks the sight lines from the viewing pane. Also, because of the gyre's design is basically like a low profile tube, it's barely noticeable right at the top of the water while producing a lot of flow back towards the other end of the aquarium. At the end of the aquarium, is an external overflow box that extends through a cutaway in the wall leading to the utility room. The box design itself is a bean animal overflow that is supposed to be very quiet. Most of the noise associated with an overflow box is the slurping sound of air going into the drain. And this overflow eliminates that noise by having the main drain completely submerged using a gate valve for precision control. The other two drains you see are to maintain a certain height and there's the full backup in case that setting of the main gets thrown off by either long-term growth inside the piping or a blockage of some sort like a snail. These drain lines from the overflow box make their way down into a couple of filter socks into a very basic sump. The sump is interesting in that it is really two sumps that are tied together using bulkheads. This is the first time I've ever seen this, but in theory it should work as long as both sides have that rubber gasket to seal it. By installing the sump in two halves, it makes it easier to get into that back room. This sump measures eight feet by three feet by something like 16 inches tall. So you can imagine how difficult it would be to maneuver something that size down the stairwell and then into a tight corner. It's much easier to do in halves. 
the filtration on this system is very old school. Aside from the filter socks that we talked about, there's a pump that feeds a large protein skimmer. This is a Reef Octopus 8000, which for its size is a bargain. I use one of Tidal Gardens, and it's probably my favorite of all of the skimmers that we use. In the future, this one is going to be getting an automatic neck cleaning wiper blade, which should cut down a bit on the maintenance, as well as improve performance as it's cleaner longer. The big calcium reactor next to it is the largest unit that GEO makes. This is a 12 inch model, which is rated for systems over a thousand gallons. Calcium reactors, they can be a bit intimidating for hobbyists that have never used one. But in practice, they're actually super simple, and I personally recommend anyone with a large tank to consider one. If you want to know more about how these devices function, I'll put a link to my video talking in depth about them. There are a couple of accessories on this particular calcium reactor that make it stand out. The first thing is this extra reaction chamber. The pH of water inside a calcium reactor hovers between 6.6 .6 to 6.8 in order to dissolve the calcium carbonate media, which then gets stripped back slowly into the aquarium. In a basement setup like this, where gas exchange is an issue, the overall pH of the system can drift lower than the recommended 8.3. Obviously, better air exchange would help, but every little thing kind of helps contribute to that. In this case, the second reaction chamber serves to soak up the last bits of CO2 in the effluent and raise the pH of the water returning to the tank. It's a minor benefit, but if you have a tank already struggling with low pH, even the small benefits add up and take the edge off. The other accessory that is kind of uncommon is the use of a peristaltic pump to deliver water to the reactor. A typical calcium reactor uses a small power head like a MaxiJet, and you control the flow by a valve on the end of the effluent line. Over time though, that valve or that pump can get gummed up and the flow rate through the reactor changes, so the hobbyist has to make sure to service those two items to make sure that the reactor operates consistently. Now by using a peristaltic pump, this reactor gets delivered a consistent flow rate and there's no valve on the effluent end. It just remains wide open and the flow rate is completely dictated by the speed of that peristaltic pump. I have personally never used a pump like this, but it is interesting. The criticisms are that eventually the hoses and the heads have to be replaced and the initial cost of the unit is much higher than a small power head. But I can see the appeal for those looking to dial in a specific flow rate and also have less risk of it deviating from that flow rate over time. The last thing that I'll cover about the equipment is the lighting. Over the tank are Ecotech Radeon Pro LEDs. There are six XR30 units with two light pucks apiece, and then there's two XR15 units with a single puck. I don't have to tell you anything about these lights. They are very highly regarded in the industry, and everyone that I've spoken to really likes their performance. These fixtures right now are set to 45% power using a preset that mimics an ATI AquaBlue Special Bulb, which is kind of like ATI's daylight colored bulb. At 45% power, the PAR levels are at 250 at the surface and 100 at the bottom. LEDs are a point light source, so you will get some visible glitter lines. Ecotech did a good job in blending the light so you don't see the color separating out into some weird disco ball effect. Also, the optics of the LEDs in this fixture help eliminate the spotlight effect created by harsh shadows. What also helps eliminate the spotlight effect is that Ricoh installed the lighting very high off the water, allowing the light to spread before hitting the surface. They're a good 24 inches off the water, which also is good for helping keep them clean. If you have water splashing two feet over the top of the tank, you have other problems entirely. 
while I've seen these lights before, this is the first time filming a tank with them. I was really curious to see how well the picture comes out because in the past, I was never really happy with how LEDs looked like on camera. I have to admit, these units look pretty good. There have been a lot of improvements over the years and I hope that trend continues into the future. It will be cool to see what this tank looks like in the next six to 12 months as stuff fills in and colors up under these lights. That pretty much does it for this visit to Rico's Aquariums. If you like these sort of videos, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, do the bell thing, all that stuff. So anyways, good luck with your aquariums, and I hope to see you all next time. Happy reefing.